Um, welcome to the December Perma Youth Gathering. Um, we are so excited that all of you guys are here and we're so excited to have Rosemary with us. Um, yeah, we're having this wonderful changing of seasons and I am so excited to be here and honored to be a part of this movement. <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Uh, yes, welcome. And we want to start our meeting with a land acknowledgement. So I'll, uh, I'll do mine. And then if you know the land that you're on and want to add it to the chat, um, feel free to do that. Um, I want to honor the elders past, present, and future of the Tawakani, the Humanos, the Wichita, and the Caddo people. Um, and where I live, it, it was a a place of commerce, just like it is the Dallas area is now. Um, so I find that really fascinating. So I am also going to add to the chat. Um, there it is. Well, oh, I don't know if it left the links in there, but um, there's different ways to find out what land you're on if you do not know. And uh, you can text your zip code to the number in there. Um, it was all divided up in bullets on my on my end, but it didn't come out that way. Um, but <laughs> it will immediately send it back to you what what land you're on. So it's really interesting. So um, anyway, we we recognize that permaculture is uh, the permaculture movement is a mirror image to uh, indigenous cultures, and we want to learn from them and honor them in everything that we do. Um, so one of the uh, first special guests that we want to hear from tonight is our dear friend Eve Ballard and Eve is co-founder of the Global Perma Youth Movement and she is here with us uh, from Australia and um, she has graced us with so many of her beautiful works and I think tonight you have a, share, a new one to share with us right Eve? Yeah and Eve, before you share can you tell us how old you are? I'm 13. So, how, how old are you? 13. 13? Yes. Whoa. <laughs> so be prepared to um, <laughs> you knock, knock your socks knocked <laughs> off. <laughs> All right, Eve. <laughs> Thank you, Annette. Um, so I would also like to do an acknowledgement of country. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Gubby Gubby people, traditional custodians on the land on which I sit today, and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I recognise their continuing connection to the land and waters and thank them for protecting this coastline and its ecosystems since time immemorial. I extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. I'd also like to acknowledge my ancestral links to the Ngāti Puro people from Aotearoa. I believe that spoken word poetry connects individuals through words and verse, so I'd like to connect with you all today with a poem I've written called The Table of Memories. How easily happiness begins within a thorny kingdom, woven in between branches and leaves with infinite wisdom. Eight moons have passed and I'm dancing with the bees, as in dwelling around, to them, I am their queen. Blackberry juice smudge playfully across my cheeks, the sense of adventure and beauty at its peak. I am at the kitchen table where the world began, food from the garden laid out in the warming pan. The sizzling of the butter, then the tumble of onions, had the zucchini, then tomatoes by the hundreds. Echoing laughter of past women as they bustle around the kitchen, and the splash of the soap as they scrub the pile of dishes. Our tiny earth holds precious gifts beneath the soil. People have their struggles, but what about Mother Earth's daily toil? We think we can do whatever we want to better humanity, but loving the earth and soil keeps us healthy. We've done such a tragedy. The immersion of hands in the earth and toes in the dirt, wind in your hair and flour from breakfast on your shirt. There are many creatures under our feet, but they all work as one. We need to worship below, not up at the sky with the sun. Last night, the apple tree shook and gave each lettuce a heart. Every plant, every piece of food is all connected, never apart. The tree stands like a fork of lightning in the rain. Only the ignorance of a landscape view remains. When I take off my shoes and feel the life that runs under the ground, 
I can feel bits and pieces of my past under my feet like a wave of sound. Memories forever rooted in time were clustered in the afterlife. I plant flowers and vegetables. I harvest memories and life. Despite our accomplishments and the blood that flows through our veins, we still owe our existence to a six inch layer of topsoil and the fact that it rains. Seldom do we realize that the world is no thicker to us than the footprints we leave, but it is from the underground that these grain blades have sprung like make-believe. I think about how we have completely excluded the earth from our minds, like conformity. There are only a few who consider its physical hugeness, its rough enormity. Somehow we have managed to shut out the face of the giant from our windows, but the giant is there nevertheless, lingering in our city shadows. The dough rises in the sun on a windowsill, the cultural accommodating the natural in goodwill. I see the woman, past, present and future, punching it down, kneading the dark flower into the light, letting it bake until brown. Setting the table with music in the air, lighting candles and laying the bread down with a prayer. Learning the power of a single word like spinning river into flower. Eat rings out like a sense of adventure on the hour. The sizzling of the butter, then the tumble of onions. Add the zucchini, then tomatoes by the hundreds. Echoing laughter of past women as their children pass through. The world begins at the kitchen table and perhaps it'll end there too. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Thank you. I think every, everyone you share with us gets more beautiful than the last. Yeah, <laughs> I'm crying a little bit. <laughs> Very awesome. Yeah, yeah. Very Eva's, awesome. Eva's amazing. <laughs> Maybe all the way in Australia, but and she's part of global permeate, but uh, we consider her part of permeate Americas as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. We really appreciate that, Eve. It's beautiful. Okay, hard to move past yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we started Perma Youth Americas um, to give youth a, a platform, a voice, um, so they can be heard and uh, they can share their stories of what they're doing within permaculture, whether it is an artistic um, activism path such as Eve or um, it's a path working in their garden, um, lots of different directions they can go and we'd love to hear what they are all doing um and so and we and we want to hear much more from them than us and um but <laughs> i know chanel i agree <laughs> <laughs> no my eyes are just burning <laughs> i had a so, few little tears <laughs> so we uh we is uh chanel and Alan and I, and I'm going to give them a chance to say hello too. So, um, and I'm Annette, and I live in North Texas, and I met Chanel during our first PDC, and uh, we've done our teachers training and our children practitioner training together, which is where we met Alan. Um, so, Chanel, you want to say a couple? Yeah. Words? Hi, I'm. Uh, as she said, my name is Chanel, and um, yeah, I love permaculture, and I think that it's the answer to pretty much all the world's problems. And yeah, um, I'm just gonna leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Alan, are, are you able to talk? Did we lose Alan? I think we might've lost him. Okay. He is journeying. He is. So on the road. Time, yeah. Um, <laughs> He lives, Alan lives in Costa Rica, and, oh. and so he has brought um, a very important piece to our team, and we love working together. We love what we do. Um, yeah, we're family. We are, we are. So I think we need to dive right in because we want to hear from our special, very special guest, and I have the honor of introducing her. Um, Rosemary has been immersed in herbalism um, in every possible form that you can imagine for 45 years, probably even more than that, <laughs> probably <laughs> since you were a child. <laughs> um, and if you're not familiar with any of her books, she has written uh, 
12, right? I believe. Yeah. <laughs> um, I highly recommend you check those out. And the very first link that's at the top of the chat will take you there, um, as well as to her course, The Science and Art of Herbalism, which I um, very highly recommend. I graduated that earlier this year, and um, what I received from that course was very invaluable. Of course, I learned a lot about herbalism and, um, and making incredible things and how to blend, and the, the biggest thing I received was that I know the plants around me like I know my dear friends. And I may not know everything about them, like just like I don't know everything about my friends, but I do know them. And I have a relationship with them. And I have a lot to learn, but I, I do have that. And um, that is a, a completely invaluable gift that Rosemary gave to me. So thank you, Rosemary. It can, that, that will always be with me. Um, and Rosemary is the co-founder and former director of the International Herb Symposium at the New England Women's Herbal Conference and the founding president of the United Plant Savers um, and the co-founder and original formulator of Traditional Medicinal Tea Company. So that <laughs> is completely amazing. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna let Rosemary just dive in and tell you more about herself and then share the amazing uh, information she has to share with us today. Um, Rosemary, thank you so much for being with us. I'm so honored to have you as our guest tonight. Thanks, Annette. Yeah, I was. I have to say, I was very honored and a little nervous to be <laughs> speaking to the permaculture youth. You know, because I I do know that you're our future leaders and our spokespeople. And just listening to Eve read that poem, I mean it. The reason it brought tears to all of our eyes because there's there's the hope you know hmm. there's there's where the change is there's where it's all happening and quite truthfully i'm sure that there are youth in this group who could be teaching this class because um you know just because people are are so entwined with plants and i know i've met so many young people who are so knowledgeable about the plants these days I know when I first started teaching was actually in 1971 was when I started teaching my first classes. I wasn't much older really than a lot of you here. I was in my very, very early 20s, like I had just turned 20. And um, I really didn't know very much because at that time there really wasn't a lot to know. There, was, there wasn't a lot of herb books. Um, there really wasn't a lot of teachers. There was no classes or courses being offered. There was one, uh, there was one uh, home study course that was coming out of Canada that was written by uh, an elder named Ella Bursnick. And it actually, everybody, uh, just about everybody I know who's by age graduated from that course just because there wasn't anything else to take. Plus Ella was an elder and she held a lot of information. So I never took that course because I was just too busy backpacking and uh, working with the plants and just sort of hands-on and wasn't wasn't able to slow down enough to study in that way. But yeah, so, um, but, you know, just a little bit of my background is I actually am one of what I call one of the fortunate ones. Um, when I was growing up, my grandmother, who was an herbalist from Armenia, lived very close to us through my whole childhood. And she just really felt it was her duty to teach her grandchildren how to use the plants. And partly why that was is she loved them anybody who works with plants, you just fall, you fall into them, you know, they wrap their arms around you and kind of claim you. And yeah, you, whether you're a gardener or a farmer or a medicine maker or a cook, you know, who works with plants, they just have a way of embracing you, right? And kind of calling you into service is what I say. So my grandmother just loved them, but she also really felt, she used to tell us when we were children that it was her belief um, in God and her knowledge of the plants that saved her life. And she meant it literally because she was a survivor of the Armenian genocide. And partly how she survived was through faith and hope, and also because she knew what to eat on the death march, right? So she and her family, actually a couple members of her family, were did survive. And um, so, yeah, I kind of grew up with these plants. Just, um, I grew up on a small dairy farm, so they were all around me. But I grew up with my grandmother, like, telling me how important it was to know these plants. And um, yeah, like so many people um, through the ages, you know, I just felt like I had that green blood in me and 
you know, once I said yes to them, they just started working through me and I could, you know, feel them inside me. I actually felt like they were speaking directly to me, you know, so. And then when I, I spent a lot of my youth backpacking and just spending a lot of time in the mountains, learning from the plants and, um, and as soon as I could, you know, I was able to work and save up a bit of money and I opened up a little home apothecary. It was just a very small little herb store. And I actually ran that store for 18 years in that community. And I learned so much, you know, it was at a time when, like today, if you run an herb store, you're told that, you know, you really shouldn't give advice over the counter. It's not really recommended because of legal things. And also because they always say, you know, when you're trained properly, they say, but you can't really do much good just telling somebody what to do over the counter. But I have to tell you, um, I know how much I could do over the counter because so many people were helped by just that simple, by somebody listening to them and then just mixing up herbs. And um, yeah, I can still go back 50 years later and walk down the streets of Sebastopol and Tustoma County and people will tell me about how those herbs helped them. So I know they did. And that store, by the way, interestingly enough, is still on the main street of the little town I grew up in. Rosemary's Garden is still there. It's been there for since 1972 is when we opened the doors. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Wow. <laughs> it kind of dates me, but yeah. So, um, and from there, it was just a matter of, I just, you know, continued. I, people wanted to learn more about plants. So I taught and um, yeah, and started doing conferences and stuff. And so I sort of watched the herb community grow up around me. Am I lost? Can you see me? I can just see. Oh, good. I just saw a big screen that said iPhone, so I wanted to check. So I got to actually kind of watch the herb community grow up around me. It was kind of fun, you know, um, because really, I have to say, back in the 1970s, if you told people that you were an herbalist or working with plants, there were not very many people who were really interested. Like today, you know, if you say, oh, I'm an herbalist, I'm working with plants, People start telling you what their problems are. They want to know what this plant is or that. And you can always engage in a really fun conversation. But in those days, I, I said, I, I used to say, oh, I was the least popular person at the party for years because people would just kind of go, you work with plants, really? Um, but but we, you know, we've seen the herb, herb community grow and not just in our country, of course, but all around the world. And there's actually a global community, just like there is in permaculture, actually, in, Annette and Chanel and I were talking about this earlier is that permaculture and herbalism are very, very inter intertwined because so much of what they're about is about the plants. So that's what I really want to talk about today. Um, I don't really want to talk much about myself, but I wanted to just give a little background and say to any of you who are listening, you know, if you have a passion for the plants, oh, follow it with all your heart. Don't question it. Just do it because the plants have plans for us, you know, and all we have to do is say yes and be strong and, you know, not worry about what everybody is thinking. Just move ahead with it. And, um, yeah, it's such a joyful and incredible way of living. The same as perma permaculture. Like when you study permaculture and you realize that just doing simple things, that just the things that you can do can make an enormous difference on the planet. We actually don't have to do any more than those simple things that we can do and do well. And it's the same with plants. You know, once you start working with plants um, and you see the multi layers of what they are, like, you know, you think about them like they're food for us, they're medicine for us. They offer a spiritual way of being in the world. They offer connection to us. Like you, be, you actually become friends with the plants. They become allies, just like people do. Um, we engage in them in every breath. You know, like when we breathe out, the plants are breathing in our carbon dioxide. And when we breathe in, we're breathing in their oxygen. So every breath in and out is a, is a codependent relationship with the plants. They provide our shelter. They provide our clothing, the best of our clothing, of course, cotton and rayon and silk, hemp, you know, come from the, come from the plants or our byproduct, right, of the plants. Like when we wear wool or alpaca, we're, we're, we're wearing digested plant material. So the plants show up for us and have ever since, you know, humans began to walk this earth. Another thing, I just, I think you know this, but I just, these are some of the things that just astound me about plants is in every culture in the world, like no matter what the mythology story is, you know, whether 
it's that, you know, God created the heavens and earth in seven days, or Turtle Island came out, you know, this enormous turtle rose out of the waters. Or I know in Australia, they have creation myths, and, you know, all around the world, um, because nobody really knows, we just have stories that we relate to that have meaning for us, right? But what I want to share is in that every single one of those stories, the plants were here first. They were always here before people were. They were actually some of the very first things that were created. So people have evolved in relationship to plants. You know, they're our elders. And we have so much to learn from them. So that kind of brings us to our topic. You know, I, was, I felt very honored to be able to be speaking about our creative response to change. Um, and I think it's the 12th, it's the 12th um, concept of permaculture. And um, what the little write-up that I have about it says, change is an inevitable part of life. It's important to remember that permaculture isn't just about now, but about the future. We design for change, understanding that things will alter over time. The changing seasons, changing altitudes, attitudes, and our changing climate. So how to creatively use and respond to change. And I, I have to, as I said, I felt kind of lucky because first of all, it's number 12 and 12 is my birth month this month. And um, also I, as a Sagittarius, I really love change and I actually am very adaptable. <laughs> my husband's a Virgo and he's very fixed. So we, you know, we complement each other. I, it's not always harmonious, that fixed energy and that totally mutable energy. A very changeable energy, but oftentimes, as we learn in permaculture, right, it's the dynamics of differences that create diversity and create actually more vitality and more life. So, um, yeah, but the real reason I love that topic is because plant, what better to teach us about change than plants, right? So plants live in the cycles of change. So first of all, they're incredibly influenced, as are we, by just those lunar changes. So every day the moon changes very rapidly and plants respond to that. Their chlorophyll is actually in relation, changes in relationship to the shifting tides of the moon as well as the tides of the ocean. So they have those sudden changes, but they also change through the seasons. And in places like where I live, which is in New England and Vermont on the far north where we have really distinctive seasons, um, you really see how adaptive the chain, the chain plants are. So like you have entire forests, vast, vast, thousands of acres of trees that just, that are deciduous and they shed their leaves so that they can take their energy in and down. And that's how they, through this long period of rest, that's how they survive and how they can then, in the springtime, it's like they're risen again, right? And they, the sap rises up to their, through their roots and up into their stalks or into their great big stems and into their limbs and then into the leaves. And it's almost like they're all coming alive, but they, of course, were never dead. They're just at rest, at peace. And we see that in our gardens. Like we have all of these perennials that you would never think would survive, like minus 20 or minus 30 degrees weather. They look like they're dead, but the plants don't die. Even the ones that we think of as dead, what they've done is shed their seeds so that in the springtime they come up. So the plants teach us about this incredible rejuvenation through the seasons. And for those of us who are walking in the permaculture way and in the herbal way, we have to always be observing those seasons because they really teach us about health and wellness. So one of the things that happens in this season that we are in winter, like in, in most climates of the world, or at least in the temperate climates where we have such dramatic changes between the summer and the winters, winter was always a time of darkness. And the darkness was very nourishing. It meant that people went in, they rested, the outer work, the gardens and the forest work and all of that was at rest. And you actually had shorter days so that you had, could sleep more and dream more. And a lot of dreams would, a lot of that sleep creativity would come up. And then when the spring comes, you're completely renewed. But of course, we don't live in those cycles anymore, right? Because we flip on our lights. We have cars that drive everywhere. And so people get worn out really much easier than they used to, even though they worked a lot harder, right? There was so much physical labor that went on. 
but they were much more robust and uh, not just robust in their physical beings, but robust in spirit, you know, like they weren't so easy uh, with the winds of change that blew them over. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I see happening so much to people because we've become so out of tune with the natural cycles of life, right? These rhythms of nature that we don't have anchors that, that root us deep. Our, our roots don't go down deep, as deep as, as they used to, where we could really root into the seasons that were around us. And again, that's what's so beautiful about the study of permaculture, because it does teach you to root in and to work with the cycles. But plants are master teachers at that. You just watch them. You know, you just watch what they do. And um, what, a lot of times people look and they think a garden looks so bleak in the wintertime. I look out and I just think, I just see life. I just see everything at rest. And I know that in the springtime, though, it's almost a jubilant energy that bursts back up, you know, and we feel that too as human beings, right? So, and I want to talk a little bit more about the seasons and just talk about some practical things that um, as plant lovers and as wisdom keepers that we can do in the winter that help us keep physically balanced as well as emotional. But I just wanted us all to look at another way that the plants really teach us about how to adapt and creatively respond to the changes that are around us right now is that when you look at these plants, some of them look so fragile and so delicate, right? Little leaves and tiny, beautiful flowers. And some of them are very robust, like the big trees and stuff. But um, these plants have survived unbelievable cataclysmic changes. So not only the changes of the seasons, um, the changes of cycles, but these huge cataclysmic changes. So everywhere that any of us live right now, our homes have been permanently changed by big cataclysmic things that are beyond our memory, happened way before our lifetimes. For any, you know, like for instance, when I was living in California, it was all that volcanic. Uh, several millennia ago, huge volcanic eruptions changed the landscape entirely, growing new earth, destroying, semi-destroying what was there, and whole new plant systems came up. Where I live now in New England, it was the glacier just 10,000 years ago, not even so long ago in history at all. A glacier that was two miles tall sat here, sat here for a few thousand years, and it ground down the mountains. We used to have the largest, highest mountain range in the North American continent where the Adirondacks, right? Now they're just kind of hills. The highest one is around 4,000 feet, um, but which is high, but not like 28,000 feet like they used to be. But what, but what I really wanna point out is about the plant life that, that changed. So before that glacier, it was an entirely different set of plants. And then after the glacier, we had a whole new community of, that just moved in and they came in through birds pooping them and through the wind dispersal and you know all the to water and all the different ways that plants travel and they carpeted the earth they created these biodiverse communities again and they throve and so and they 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 didn't survive they thrived right they just they grew to where we have this lushness throughout all of new england and so wherever we're standing right now, when we look at this landscape that we're standing on, it's in constant change. So, and that gives me a lot of hope because I know that we're, we're trembling right now about what we're seeing going on the earth. It's very painful to us, all of us, because we are sense organs for the earth. We are of the earth. You know, we're uh, made of the same stardust the earth is made of, right? And so um, we're trembling because we feel her trembling, right? And what we need to be doing really is rooting deep. I always love that image actually of the seaweed. They have these hold fasts, like the big, huge bull kelps. They have a little hold fast that just sucks onto the rocks or the big trees going down or the plants like alfalfa that dig these deep, deep roots down into the ground and they bring up all the trace minerals. But with that bull kelp, what it does is it sucks onto the rocks and then it just with waves and moves with the waves but it's holding fast, you know, it's just flexible and moving and changeable. Mm. So, um, yeah, so when, I, but, so when I see what's going on now, uh, there's many levels to it. And there is a lot that we all have to do. We can see that there's tremendous imbalance. Primarily, we see it pe between people and people, just such cruelty rather than kindness, you know? 
Um, and we see it in the way that we treat the Mother Earth because of, again, this disconnection from her, from, from um, knowing that we're really of her, you know, that we are of her and we, we are, uh, feel her and she feels us. So, um, yeah, but when I look at back through time and recognize that there were great forces at work long before we were even here, and the earth just continues to adapt and change. And so we have this opportunity right now. Um, and I know, I know that's why the youth are here because they're doing it to be part of that change and to be the positive part. I mean, there are, we hear a lot of bad news in the world. There's a lot of bad things going on, but there is far more good things going on than there are bad. Um, we just not fed that. And I think if we were fed that more, it would nourish us and feed us, you know, it's, Mm -hmm. That old saying about the white wolf and the bat and the black wolf, you know, and it's who you feed that's what emerges. And I think that we have to really start, continue to recognize the changes that need to be made, but we need to be telling the good stories, which I know you all are doing. So, yeah, so, um, so plants are grand teachers on adaptability and change and creative change, really. Um, and we see it in our backyards. This is what I was trying to point out. You know, we see it in our backyards. We see it in the seasons. Or we see it in our landscapes around us. But we really, if we just take a step back and look back through time, and I feel like I'm really talking about, you know, millennials of time and recognize even in the place where we're sitting and standing, the tremendous amounts of change that have happened there. It, it, it just lets us know that we're on a long, long journey. <laughs> And this is just a small part of it. So let's bring it back to winter and just talk about some practical things because as herbalists and plant lovers, um, as we learn to work and change with the cycles, this is a really important cycle for us because anybody who's working with herbs, and I'd love to know who, which of you are, will know that the herbs and herbal way of life keeps us busy through all the seasons, but certainly in the winter time is when we're most busy making medicines for people for our communities. If you're a medicine maker and you, you make products or if you run an herb business, you're usually far busier in the winter time because winter time is a challenging time for most people. And again, if you live in the tropics, it's not so true. You have a whole different cycle and a season. And I'm not sure how it is in Australia. I think you're exactly the reverse of us. But those seasonal changes can, they can create challenges. And for those people who live in a temperate climate or a cold weather climate, winter presents a series of challenges. And nature, the plants, present the answers for us, really. There's just remarkable herbs that are available to help us and to create a really strong, healthy immune system that's able to respond to all the flus and cold viruses that go around. We have herbs that are really helpful for lightening our spirits because a lot of times in those long gray days, people often get gray, you know, and they kind of um, miss the sun and the light. And yet nature provides these sunshiny plants that lift our spirits and actually are really helpful. Um, yeah, so, and we have, uh, and all of the plants I wanna talk about are the really common plants are the ones that are growing in your wild in your backyard. Some of them are growing cultivated in your backyard and almost all of them are kitchen herbs. So I have a really good slideshow that I thought we'd start with. But maybe before I start, I'll just show you some of my favorite products because you're going to see some of these herbs in the slideshow. But these would be the things that I would say that you should have at home. And they're all super easy to prepare. You know, that's one of the beautiful things about both permaculture and herbalism is that herbalism, herbalism can be expensive. You know, if you go to an herb store and you buy a little one ounce jar of echinacea, it's like you're paying, what you're paying for is this care and time that somebody took to grow those herbs, to say their prayers over them when they harvested them, to clean them by hand, you know, or by their washing machines or whatever they're cleaning them with, and then to chop them and to make the medicine. So they're not expensive in that way, but they are expensive if you have a family and you buy a one ounce bottle of echinacea tincture and you know you have to use that to keep a flu away. You're thinking, oh, should I give it to the kids or myself? You know, So in that sense, it can be a little expensive, but when you learn to make your medicines at home, um, which 
Herbalism was always medicine that was made at home. It can be so inexpensive because you can grow all of these herbs. And then really it's just sometimes the medium like apple cider vinegar or sometimes a little alcohol. But um, so one of them is the elderberry syrup. I would just really highly recommend that everybody make it and have it on hand. I, you know, usually make a quart of it and, or freeze the berries when you're collecting those berries, um, just freeze them. And then during the winter time, you breed them out and use them as you want, or you can make a big pot of it and then freeze them as you need it. It's a wonderful, wonderful medicine. I was talking to Grady before we started class and he was telling me how he, he didn't make his elderberry syrup because he ate all those elderberries before his mom could make the syrup. And it really got me laughing because in every single book you read, except for mine, it tells you not to eat the raw elderberries. And I would say it's probably good not to eat a lot of them raw because the seeds, just like the apple seeds and like the almond uh, kernels have a little bit of cyanide in them, not much, but if you eat a lot of them, um, you know, it can, it can make you a little sick, not terribly toxic or anything, but it's not recommended to eat a lot of them raw. So, um, but you know, Grady did and he's happy and he looks as healthy as can be. Um, I also always recommend when you harvest elderberries that you really wanna make sure that you leave a lot for the wildlife because um, where we can go to the supermarket to get things, the supermarket is the wild plants and shrubs for the birds. And there are, in our area, we have over 36 different species of birds that count on the elderberries. So now that it's become so popular and everybody's harvesting it, um, there's not a lot being left for the birds, you know, to grate because they, they eat them fresh, but they also eat them when they're dried on the shrubs. So, and the deer like to graze on them, but it's a wonderful, wonderful, simple, easy, process to make elderberry syrup. You can go online, or you can look at any of my books. There's lots of great lessons. And then another recipe that I totally recommend you have is, you, this is a half gallon. You wanna make up a good, at least a quart, half gallon of fire cider. And fire cider is an herbal formula that's become quite popular over the years that's made with just really great kitchen herbs like ginger, garlic, onion, cayenne, and apple cider vinegar. I think I'm forgetting something. Horseradish. And mm -hmm. horseradish, the main ingredient. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and so this is a hot fiery remedy. It's not always that everybody loves it, but you know, each one of those herbs, and we'll talk about them when I do that slideshow, is a very powerful antiviral. Oh, I forgot to mention that about the about the elder. I should that you have a, a broad spectrum antiviral. That's why it's so important to have the elderberry because it can fight a huge variety of different viruses, not just one virus like a flu shot could. So uh, you have, and it's also antimicrobial and antibacterial. So it, it's a very broad spectrum infection fighter. So um, back to fire cider. So in fire cider, we have, a, we have a formula. It's like a salad dressing, really. You know, you can take a little shot glass of it. You can put it in your salad dressing. Some people like it in their you know, as a sauce over vegetables and stuff, but it is hot and fiery. So you might want to dilute it if you don't like hot food, but every single one of those herbs in there are infection fighting herbs. And then you mix it with raw apple cider vinegar and you have a probiotic. So you're, you're actually growing your intestinal garden, right? Your friendly bacteria that also is a major part of our immune system. So super, super easy to make. Um, again, you can get the recipe. It's, there's, hundreds of different recipes for making it. But you can go online. I have all these recipes too. And then I'm happy to share the recipes with you and then you can just make them available um, because I have a herb for winter health handout. And okay, then you can just great. make them available if you wanna do that. That would be wonderful. Thank yeah. You. And then uh, another uh, recipe, you're gonna, we're gonna see it in the slideshow, but it's echinacea. And so you can see, I usually make a good quart sometimes a half a gallon of echinacea. Um, a family easily can go through a quart of echinacea. And I know to buy that much would be, you know, hugely expensive. But if you grow your own echinacea and then you collect the, the flowers and the seeds and the leaves all through the season, and then you collect the root in the fall and you make a whole plant tincture, it's really the most wonderful tincture. And it it's um, echinacea is used to, as a first line of defense to fight off foreign bacteria that enters your bloodstream. It actually activates white blood cells. 
which is one of your first line of defenses and it's really effective at that it's so great so you want you don't want to just make a small amount you want to make a quart or a half gallon so that you can share it with your neighbors and you know have it prepared with families start to get ill then you can actually have enough to share with others it's a really great way for all of you young people you can start doing this now i'm telling you you could you could start a really successful business once you learn your plants and you learn how to make these medicines i know my my two daughters when they were in high school when they were freshmen they started a little business called sage mountain herbs and by the time they graduated high school they had more money than i had <laughs> they actually um were, you know they were saving their money so that we weren't expecting them to pay for their college but to pay for all of their adjunct expenses at college and they were able to do that and then they sold their little herb business it's still running they sold it to another herbalist so yeah don't be afraid to start now um so and then i make these little throat balls that are really fun to make you know they're like they look like giant pills actually they look like little rabbit turds right little rabbit pellets <laughs> But they are so good. I never go through a winter without having these made up. So they're like throat balls and they have um, they have some infection fighting herbs. They have a little golden seal in there, a little myrrh powder. But then I put things like licorice powder and uh, a little bit of marshmallow to make it really soothing. And then like cocoa powder and um, a little bit of peppermint oil. So they actually end up, and honey. So they actually end up tasting like a peppermint candy. It's really fun to make them but they're really good if you get sore throats or you get swollen lymphatics it works so good so yeah so i think um those are some of my favorite i have lots of other recipes because i love teaching people how to bring herbs into their kitchen but let's look at some of these slides uh and and are we going over time and are we good no we're good we're, we're good, good. Oh, great can i ask you though about those those throat balls are they hard or gummy um, no, they're pretty hard. So what I do with them is, um, and I just keep them at room temperature. So what I do with them is I roll them and then I roll them in a little carob and then I just air dry them. I just let them dry, you know, I cover them with a cloth or a piece of uh, wax paper and I, I air dry them. I just let them dry or you can put them in an um, oven with a pilot light on them and just let them dry overnight. And then I just store them on the shelf. I like them to be hard because then you can, then you suck on them slowly. If they're really gooey, you could make the recipe and then just put it in a jar and put it in the refrigerator. And then you just take a little spoonful of it. So I've done that a lot of times when I'm lazy. Um, but I like them hard because they actually, you know, you can suck on them longer. And then what that means is that the medicine is actually going down through your throat better, right? These are great for kids and kids love making them too. They're fun. Okay. So let's look at some of the pictures of the herbs. and. As I said, these are um, just common herbs. They're all geared for winter health. All of them are gonna be found in your backyard or in um, the supermarket or in your garden, you know, or in your kitchen. They're just, these are the commonest plants that, let's see. Annette, um, wait, first off, Annette, I think you're showing the wrong, uh, I, yeah. the wrong thing, but also Grady had his hand raised. Did you have a question? Did he have a question? You're muted, Grady. Can hear you, Grady. I had a I had a um comment. Okay. You remember when um when um you were talk when Rosemary God's when Rosemary God's always talking about um how plants speak to you. Um, so I have this tree in my back, in my front yard, where I live right now, and it really speaks to me. I climb it <laughs> all the time, and, and I made a little rope that hangs from it. Oh. I stand to it, and it just, like my best friend. Oh, so, <laughs> what does he say? Can you can you tell us something that he said to you, Grady? Is there anything special that you remember? Um, you can think about it and tell us later. Um, nothing really comes. To, actually, yeah, it once when I first came. Um, this is uh, uh, I was um. 
I was walking around in my um, looking at my home, and then it was like, and then it was like, hey, and then I was like, and then I just turned around, and then, and then, and then, and then it was like, climb me, and I was like, oh, are you speaking? <laughs> and I was like, uh, of course I am. <laughs> That's beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, you know, one of the things about, about <clears throat> working with plants is that I think the, the greatest gift they give us is that sense of connection, right? Um, along with all those other guests, gifts that we were talking about earlier, about food and medicine and air and clothing, shelter and all of that, is this, this gift of connection. And so many people, with children and young people, it's easier because their channels of communication are still so open. But so many older people long for that. You know, they're, they're, they long to have that connection where they hear the plants speak. And I always remind them that the plants speak in many languages. So for some people, they hear them like grading, like, climb me, come on, climb me. You know, it's like, it's like English. But most people, it's a feeling, you know, it's just something gets your attention. Like you look at a plant and it's maybe saying harvest me or, pick me or don't pick me, you know, or notice me. It's a feeling that you get where you feel like something touched you on the shoulder and you turn around. And if you pay attention and maybe have a conversation, maybe, maybe speak out loud, because that is one of the exercises that we have people do in learning to communicate with plants is to just voice what you want and tell them how beautiful they are, and how appreciative you are, that you are of them and, um, you know, and speak out loud and then you begin and then listen. And oftentimes you begin to hear, not always English, sometimes it's just you get a sense, you get a feeling, you hear a song, a poem may come through you, you know, and there are exercises, you know, there's a lot of teachers and we used to offer this in my apprentice programs, you know, opportunities to really spend with the plants and learn. There's an exercise that almost a lot of different people use, but really I would say the best exercise is just to know they are speaking to you, to trust that, and then to spend a lot of time and primarily speak out loud to them, you know, so that, um, and then pay attention to response. And response always isn't in a language. Um, uh, it can be in a feeling, in a sense, sense of something other is nearby. Um, but, and this, the art of hearing plants and speaking to plants is not reserved for just a few special people like Brady or myself, it's really available for everybody. It's just a matter of honing our senses is what we pay attention to, right? Yeah. Right, that's right. Okay. Opening, opening our hearts to the, to receiving it, right? Yeah, and, yeah. Yeah, yeah I know, you know, one of them, um, Annette remembers this question and the very final quiz after the home study course, one of the questions I just throw in there, I'm just curious what people say is, you know, have you ever seen or worked with, flower fairies and plant divas and so many people write and say they don't there's a few people that write and say they don't believe in them and a lot of people believe in them they they see them as being the energetic uh or or essence uh soul essence of the plant spirits but they and but they're regretful that they never see them and i i know that so many more people actually do see them than realize that because we're expecting to see like a little flying being or you know, something from our childhood. And that's not usually how plant spirits present themselves because it's very hard to shape shift. Like we have sh shamanic practitioners, we know, cer certainly with indigenous people around the world who were able to shape shift into different shapes, but it takes a tremendous amount of energy to do that. So for a plant, it's much easier to reach out to you in a way to get your attention that it's not so hard to shape shift. It might be a sound, a movement, the sense, the feeling of something other is near you, but you're not sure what it is, mm -hmm. or orbs of light. They often, often manifest as this unusual light, um, you know, like an unusual light. I know in Sage Mountain Gardens, in the, I would have children come there often. We used to do fairy days, right, with the children. But in the, in the evening or in the morning, especially, so at those boundary times between night and day. Um, and we would go into the garden and the children would always see them. They'd just be these orbs, not the fireflies. Those were beautiful too, but these would be actually orbs of floating light. 
So, yeah. So, uh, thank you, Grady, for that wonderful comment. Okay, let's get on and look at a few plants here. And, uh, yeah, and then I'll have you um, kind of give me a time when we're getting close to eight. So, okay. Great. Chanel, Chanel is sharing her screen for us. Um, so she'll be she'll be changing slides for you. Who? Oh, Chanel, great, Chanel, oh. super. So we'll just jump right into the first one. And um, the first one is not this one, the first plant. Oh, sorry. That's okay. There we go. So this is mullen. And mullen it belongs to a family called the verbascums. This is verbascum faspus. It's our common wild mullen. It grows in almost every environment in the world, certainly every temperate environment in the world, you're going to find it. And it's talking about change and creative change and response to uh, change. Mullen is an amazingly adaptive plant. So if it's growing on really poor soil, like it loves growing along the railroad tracks, right? Kind of polluted soil, all rocks, it's, there's nothing there. And then it grows kind of small. You also see it growing out of volcanic ash. You know, it'll be one of the very first plants that grow. And in that con those conditions, it, it often grows smaller, but it grows kind of mutated. It gets several heads coming out of the top of it. Not necessarily like this one, but actually whole big stalks coming out. But it also will grow incredibly beautifully in um, lush garden soil. So when you in a in when it, you see it growing in a garden, it looks like a like a centerpiece plant in a garden. It's absolutely stunning. We'll go to the next slide. Um, the next slide shows just the rosette. It's a biennial, and so the first year it sets these beautiful rosettes like this. Those little yellow flowers in the background are not the mullein flower. Those are a dandelion flower. Just wanted to point that out. It's these rosettes when the flat, when the leaves are really downy and soft and, and they look so healthy, don't they? Um, this is when you'd be collecting them. The, flat, the leaves are an amazing herb for bronchial and respiratory issues. And then the, um, and they're used in a lot of the cough formulas. And one of the reasons that they work so well for respiratory infections is because they have an astringent property. So they're drying, they help to dry up the mucus, but they're also um, have a mucilaginous property. So it's soothing. The mucilaginous are those plants that soothe inflamed tissue. So you have both of that in this leaf. So you have a plant that dries up and fights uh, infection and dries up excess mucus. You also have a plant the leaves that also um, help with that inflammation and that kind of raw bronchial feeling that you get. So you often see this plant combined with um, other herbs for a cough. It was also used in smoking mixtures, like the, a lot of the indigenous smoking mixtures, kinikinik blends they were called. They often had the mullein flower, mullein leaf in them. We'll go to the next slide. And then the next one is, yeah, so this is um, a flower stalk. So the, the flower stalk emerges in the second year. Of the, and this particular flower is a Greek mullen. A lot of medicine makers grow this one because you can see it grows many arms and, and you get a ton of flowers. So the leaves are very medicinal, but the flowers are very medicinal as well. Um, the flowers are probably, I would say, the best remedy that we have for ear infections. And they're also incredibly powerful pain relievers. They're not used so much for that anymore. Are we having a problem with our little slideshow? I think so. Is it there? She's, it's coming back. Okay, great. Yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, so um, they're not, we don't see uh, mullein flowers used much for pain anymore other than ear infections, but it's a very powerful nerving. And the eclectic doctors, which was the main medical profession in the United States in the 1800s and the early 1900s, um, they used mullen a lot for different kinds of, as an anodyne for different kinds of pain. I do wanna point out before we move from this slide. So this is a beautiful example of permaculture, right? This is a diverse garden, everything just growing together, creating beauty. And this is a medicinal herb garden. So. All of these beautiful plants are all medicinal. This one that in the front, and the very pink one, is the um, Queen of the Meadow. It's a uh, Queen of the Meadow. Oh, botanical name has is Meadow Sweet. It's a Meadow Sweet, so it's very high in salicylic acid. 
But anyway, just that incredible biodiversity that we see in gardens that make them thrive. So many, when you have so many different members of the plant communities living together, they just feed on, you know, they, they help one another. You just have a beautiful gardens when we do that. And I know in permaculture, that is definitely one of the foundations is that, that diversity. So yeah, we'll move on here. Next slide. I should learn how to do this. And so this is, um, this is making mullein flower oil. These are all the mullein flowers. And by the way, it's really important when you pick mullein flowers that you not cut the stalks. You're actually picking the little flowers. You always wanna leave those stalks because they host a billion seeds. And those seeds um, feed the birds. They're also like, I always call them like little insect condominiums, you know, lots and lots of insects like to live in those. And throughout the winter, the birds come and they, feed on those seeds. So you don't want to cut the stalks. I know early on, before I forgot to tell my students that I would see them coming back with these enormous stalks that they'd cut for the whole, they were going to collect the flowers and they would cut the whole stalks. It was like, oh, you don't want to do that. You, you know, you want to be as gentle with the plant when you're harvesting from it. Always ask permission before you before you harvest and say your prayers out loud, just give thanks, you know, be gratitude, sing a little song if you'd like to. The plants love to be sung to. Yeah. So here, um, mullein flower oil is being made. This is a, at a farm in Ohio called Equinox Botanical. And the farmer there would make gallons of this and then sells it to lots and lots of stores. He's been doing this like for 30 or 40 years. And people are mainly using these, the mullein flower for ear infections, especially for small children. Yeah, okay, we'll move on. And then coltsfoot is another herbs that we see oftentimes combined with mullein, which is why I put it in the slideshow. We very often you'll see coltsfoot comfrey um, and mullein combined for, as a respiratory tea. Not everybody likes to use comfrey these days, so I left it out of the slideshow, but uh, Coltsfoot is definitely another common herb um, that we find growing in temperate regions around the world. It belongs to a very large family. This particular Coltsfoot is called Tusilaga farfara. It has a very funny Latin name. Tusilaga meant cough. It's Latin for cough. And, and this herb was so important during the Middle Ages, you know, for hundreds of years. It was a major herb that was used for the whole bronchial system, for respiratory uh, problems and for throat. Um, and so when you had a large illiterate populace who couldn't read, they would paint the sign of the colt's foot on the door. So if you saw a colt's foot, you knew that it was apothecary and that an herbalist lived there. I always thought that was so clever. So the uh, one way, a very sure way of identification is when you flip the leaf over, it has this white membrane. You can actually peel it off. Um, it grows in large clusters and it always grows near moisture. So you're going to see it along stream banks, along ditches, areas of your garden that are damp, on the edge of meadows that are damp. Um, it's never going to be in a dry area. And it also, like mullen, it has that unique ability to be both drying and soothing. Let's go to the next slide. Oh, here it is. You flip me over and my white beneath. And then if, if I could take that, I could just peel that white membrane off. It doesn't come off completely, but, you, but there's like a, a peeling that comes. You can see it down in some of these lower leaves. That's actually the white peeling coming off on the leaves. And you can see how it grows in a very tight-knit family. It, it always grows like this very together. And it's low growing. It's not a high plant. It'll be maybe one, one or two feet off the ground. Let's look at the next slide. I want you to see this one because it's kind of cool. Yeah, so these flowers look just like dandelion flowers, don't they? Or very similar, but there's no leaf. These are coltsfoot flowers. So coltsfoot will send up its flowers early, early in the spring, right after winter has passed. In our area, it's right after the snow. You can see nothing green has started to grow here. It's just a kind of a little wetland and the flowers come up and then they make those little seed puffs just like the dandelion. And they grow sometimes large amounts and people always think, my goodness, it's dandelion without the leaves. It's never dandelion. It's always cold foot. Dandelion will never flower without its leaf and dandelion comes in much later in the, in the spring and summer. So um, that's a little trick for you. So very common plant. So echinacea, so if 
you knew nothing else about plants, I know you would know about echinacea. I called it the great herbal diplomat because it more than any other herb that I know of introduced herbalism, at least to the North American continent. I don't know about the rest of the world, but I know in North America, herbs were pretty unpopular. And when echinacea came along, it came pedigreed because it had studies that were doing, that had been done in Germany of all places, because echinacea is a native to the North American continent, primarily the prairies, the huge prairie land, which of course is our most endangered ecosystem even more than wetlands in the American prairies. And um, yeah, and it's, and so it worked. So, so it had studies, they had double blind placebo studies. So people felt safe. I don't know why they feel so much safer using those scientific studies than the empirical evidence of people having used these plants for literally centuries. And the tests actually being done on human beings and not poor laboratory animals, right? It just doesn't make sense. I love science and I like the science studies, but push come to shove, I'll always count on the empirical studies, studies of people actually using the plants and seeing if they work or not over a period of time, of course, not just a cup of tea, but here we have cultures and tribes and you know, using these plants for hundreds of years. So echinacea was, it had studies, and then it was also familiar. It was a common flower. People were, uh, it was called uh, rutabecchio or, uh, you know, echinacea. And people were growing it in their yard. And it was beautiful. And it really worked. People could see that if they took echinacea, it actually kept their colds away. And so because of that, um, there became a huge market for echinacea. And and echinacea opened the doors for all those other herbs. It would have happened anyway. But I always like to say echinacea was our ambassador, right? So um, yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful plant. It is, a lot of the species are terribly endangered. So you really wanna always make sure that you know the source, ideally grow it yourself. It's a very, very hardy plant. Um, this is echinacea purpurea, which is the most common. It grows really readily. Um, the whole plant is useful. You, we, we were taught in early on to use the root, but the root is very wonderful antimicrobial, antibacterial, but the leaves are even more antimicrobial and also the flower and then the dried flower stalk. So the best echinacea is whole plant echinacea. Do you know how to make that? It's pretty simple. You know, you, you get a big gallon jar and you, add, you start by adding, um, uh, you start in the spring by picking the nice fresh green leaves before the plant flowers, and then you put a little alcohol on. And then in the summer, when the flowers are really just opening up, these are a little too old, but when they're just opening up, still in their bud-like stage, you pick them and you put them in and cover them with a little more alcohol. And then in the fall, when the seed pods are ripening, because they're also very medicinal, you put some seed pods in and you cover it with just a little alcohol. And then deep in the fall, when all the energy is restored, excuse me, returned to the earth, then you dig up your root with sacred prayer because you're asking for the whole life of that plant. You clean it well, you chop it, grind it up if you want, and you put it in with a, all that other plant material that's been infusing through the season, and then you let it sit for about another six weeks, and you have total plant echinacea, the best you can get. Okay. And then there's always the debate, which is better, which variety, you know, Echinacea purpurea, Echinacea pallida, Echinacea angustifolia. Um, they all have a little bit of different properties. They all have some mostly similar. They all work really well. But the best one to use is the one that you can grow the best and the one that's the most abundant. And that is definitely Echinacea purpurea. Angustifolia is completely at risk in its native habitat, primarily due to because of overharvesting, yeah. Really literally thousands and thousands and thousands of tonnage have been dug up in the wild prairies and shipped primarily overseas. So we have a lot of work to do to restore our prairies and our wild plants. It's wonderful work though, you know, when you start to plant these plants back in the wild and you start your wild gardens and you introduce these these native indigenous plants to your area again, they want to grow there. You know, that's their homeland. They have a long, long history and they'll thrive once you invite them back and create a place for them. So, yeah, yeah. let's keep going. What was that? <laughs>
And then, of course, this is Elder. We talked about Elder er earlier. This is not a good picture of Elder. It's a very showy plant. This is just a really young shrub. <laughs> is that Grady? I think we're just getting some feedback. I can uh, mute everyone. Wait, now we, Rosemary, you're muted too. There I go. How's that? Yeah, okay, now we're good. Oh, good. So I was just mentioning this isn't the best photo because it's a very large, it grows to be a very large shrub, almost tree-like, and it can be filled with these umbels of berries. First of all, in the spring, those beautiful creamy white umbel, those are actually really medicinal as well. They're a powerful diaphoretic, and I re always recommend having some in the winter time. So if you get a, a fever or a cold, it can help spike your fever. It makes you sweat and you can help to sweat out your cold. It's an old, old formula. We call it gypsy cold care, though. I know gypsy is not a politically correct word anymore. So, but that was the name. That was actually what the gypsies called it too, gypsy cold care. Um, but we could call it Roma cold care <laughs> or maybe elderflower cold care. But it's a mixture of the elderflowers, peppermint and yarrow. And um, it was used, as I said, just to kind of, it would help spike your fever, make you sweat, and then that would always bring the fever down. It's a wonderful formula for colds. But then, and then those flowers will ripen into these beautiful, or develop into these beautiful berries. By the way, those flowers are also delicious and edible and make a great tea. And the best elderflower fritters are made with those fritters. If, you, if you're into wild food cooking, it is yummy. And then we then it ripens into the berries in by midsummer or late summer, um, and this herb is probably one of the top selling herbs in the world right now, uh, and for good reason. You know, it tastes good. You can it makes a wonderful, wonderful remedy for children. It's fun to make the syrup. Uh, you know, the biggest thing that I see is we we get need to get people planting the elders because you know they can't keep elderberry in stock especially because it's used in the pharmaceutical industry. You find it in you know, the uh, pharmacy stores now and it's just everywhere. So, uh, and a lot of it is still coming, unfortunately, from the wild sources. It's really time that we, it's not that we kept wildcraft, wildcrafting is one of our arts, but we need to just be wildcrafting the really common, wonderfully abundant weeds. And most of the more sensitive plants we need to cultivate, which again, you know, when you cultivate these plants, you're really supporting another endangered spe species, which is the farmer, right? Yeah, a lot of, a lot of people are really looking to, to start to purchase these from organically from farmers who are growing them. So you have a broad spectrum antiviral uh, used for colds and flus, just to boost your immune system, fight off infections, you know, and taste delicious. A lot of times we just use it, we mix it with a little sparkling water. You can make little cordials with it, it's so good. All right, you know, we can move on. And then I, I wanted to start with rosemary um, to lead us into a few of the kitchen herbs because every one of those kitchen herbs that you have in your spice cabinet are there because they're a powerful medicine. You know, none of them really taste what you'd say tastes delicious, right? Um, even cinnamon, which is sweet, has kind of a bitter taste. You can only eat a little bit. So the reason that they became familiar with cooking is because they were used for health purposes. And the only real difference that, that separates them from being a culinary and a medicinal is dosage, the amount you use. So if you don't have an apothecary with, you know, golden seal and elderberry and, you know, uh, some of the other herbs in there and you're at somebody's house and they have oregano and thyme and rosemary and garlic and ginger, I mean, you've got an incredible amount of herbs to work with to help fight colds and infections. So rosemary is my namesake. I have a special, a special relationship with rosemary, but I have it in the slideshow because um, it's a powerful antioxidant and a powerful uh, herb for fighting infections. Um, uh, it also is an herb that's used for memory. It's in one of my famous formulas called the uh, rosemary brain tonic. Um, which I use quite often, especially as I get older. It's nice if you can, like I know if you live in a more temperate climate, you can grow rosemary outdoors year round. Where I grew up in California, I was living in a zone eight. 
And rosemary grew like a shrub and a tree there. It was just everywhere. I took it for granted. It was so, well, I wouldn't say that. I loved it. And there were so many varieties. But when I came to New England, uh, I became a rosemary murderer. I, I killed so many rosemary plants because it's so hard to figure out how to get them to winter over indoors because they hate dry heat and we heat it with wood stoves. They hate it when you overwater. You know how they're not fussy at all outside? You just plant them and they grow. Indoors, they don't like being indoors, you know. But I have some big ones now that I've gotten through and I, but I have to baby them, I have to watch them. Um, so I like to keep them indoors because I use them a lot in tea and then cooking. And I dry a lot of it too, but I love the fresh rosemary. You know, I just, you can feel how antiseptic it is. I think it's very, very important herb right now for people to be using a lot of, um, you know, because we have so many viruses out there and we just need to be using all these antivirals. We don't see much about this, you know, in the news, hardly anything about people self-caring and building immune systems and what we can do to keep ourselves healthy during a pandemic. Um, but there is so much we can do. And it's not necessarily that I'm saying that we could actually keep the coronavirus away. We don't really know that. We've never had this particular virus, but we do know that there are many herbs that, have, that fight viruses, you know, and have been doing it effectively. So I think it's really worth using these plants in our daily rituals. So let's move on, see who we have next here. This is thyme. This is actually Fairy Castle in the herb gardens at Sage Mountain, where I lived for 30 something years. Um, it's in Vermont, and the whole bed around it is all thyme. And thyme is a very wonderful herb to have. <laughs> you can't have too much thyme, right? So you want to plant all the thyme you have. Um, but it's also a very excellent herb for the immune system. Uh, it's an antiviral, antibacterial. It's an incredibly potent herb for fighting infection. In fact, thymol, which is an essential oil, very powerful chemical constituent in thyme, is used in a lot of disinfectants, both disinfectants used in cleansing, you know, for spraying counters and toilets and stuff, as well as a lot of disinfectants that are taken internally. Yeah, and thyme makes a delicious tea. It's very, so if you like pungent, you know, like if you like the taste of pungent or um, savory, Thyme and rosemary and those teas actually are really nice. I like to make teas with a little tiny bit of miso, like a, a probiotic of miso, um, and then just use herbs like thyme and rosemary and oregano as the flavoring. And it's, it's a wonderful to sip. You could call it a soup, but it's really a tea. And you're getting all those probiotics which support healthy bacteria, but your gut flora, it's like you're growing a beautiful garden inside your belly, right? Um, yeah, and then you're also helping to fight off infections during the winter. There you go. And then here's some more of our culinaries. I was making a, a, a fire cider here. And you see garlic and the horseradish root. Horseradish root, I, I really highly recommend that you all grow it. And then you, and if you're not growing it, make sure that you store one, a whole root in your refrigerator. They dry out, so it is good to wrap them. You can wrap them in beeswax, the beeswax wrappings now, or wax paper, or saran wrap, you know, but something that keeps them fresh through the winter time, because it's the best remedy there is for any kind of sinus congestion. Horseradish is a mighty herb for fighting, fighting um, head colds and sinus infection and any deep-seated bronchial health. I always have people, if people have a sinus infection, I make them grate the horseradish by hand because by the time they finish grating a little bit, their sinuses will be totally cleared out. It's that potent. So everything there, your, your garlic, well, I think they have another picture of garlic. So fire cider is just simply, you know, grating garlic, uh, excuse me, grating horseradish, chopping garlic, chopping onion, grating ginger, putting it in a bowl with a little bit of the cayenne and then covering it with apple cider vinegar. There's, as I said, there's so many good recipes, and I'll send the handout to Annette, and then she can make copies for you if you'd like. And then let's see, we'll move on, and there's our garlic harvest. So garlic is called the poor man's penicillin, the poor man's penicillin, and it's um, in, in the middle, age, middle, middle Ages, when they had that terrible, terrible pandemic that 
uh, the Black Death, it was called, that swept through Europe and really decimated entire cities. You know, like I think Siena, like two thirds of the population died in that city. And garlic was one of the herbs that the people used to keep um, the infection away. We don't know how effective it was, but we do know that there are stories that have survived um, about the effectiveness of garlic. One is the Four Thieves story, you know, that uh, there were young gra grave robbers that were robbing the graves. And nobody worried about it too much because they figured they would die because they were robbing the graves of people who had died of the flu of that pandemic. Um, but they didn't die. They continued to rob the graves. So they, when they finally caught them, they had a choice either of telling their oh, formula or or yeah, just I don't want that falling or popping. And they and they just and they told their formula and garlic. They were using what was called the Four Thieves formula, and garlic was definitely a big important part of that formula. So yeah, a lot of times people, if they start to feel cold on coming on and they're really brave, they chop a little bit and just you know put a small amount in their mouth. That's pretty potent. It can also burn. You never want to do that to children, but it does work. What I like to do is I like to pickle it. Of course, I put it in my fire cider. It's a major ingredient in the fire cider, but I also pickle it. It's really simple. You just take the garlic and you uh, take whole cloves and you put it in like say a pint or a quart jar and you cover it with apple cider vinegar and you let it sit for about four to six weeks. And then at the end of that time, pour off half the liquid, save that garlic vinegar for salad dressings, et cetera, and then just add honey to cover the garlic. So you have half vinegar, half honey, and the garlic, and let it sit, it mellows, and it gets unbelievably delicious and sweet. You have to let it sit in the garlic vinegar for about another two or three weeks. Um, and then you get the, it's still raw. It has all of the benefits of that raw garlic, but it's been tamed by the honey and the vinegar. It's not nearly as hot and it's quite delicious. I think that recipe is also on this handout. It's again, something really fun to make. It makes great presents for your friends who have everything right. <laughs> okay. We go through about that much garlic every season. All right, let's move on. And then this is a very important one. And I think we're probably coming towards the end of our time, but. Um, I'm glad we reached this one. This is a plant that is native to the North American continent. It's definitely one of the plants that we've identified as at risk or endangered in its native habitat. It's one of Amer North America's uh, greatest contributions to world medicine. It's used by herbalists around the world as well as in the pharmaceutical industry. And it's golden seal or hydrastis canadensis is its botanical name. It's rich in many chemicals, but two very important ones, hydrastine and berberine. And those two chemicals are known to fight infection. It's a strong herb. Um, we only use it when it's not a preventative. It's not an herb that you would take to prevent getting a cold or for prevent getting a flu. It's when you, when you have one, you take it. Because it's at risk and endangered, a lot of herbalists are using Oregon grapefruit in place of it. It also has the berberine in it. But I, I really recommend using golden seal, but just purchasing organically cultivated, not using the wildcrafted. And you can also, let's look at the next uh, slide. You see the roots. It's primarily the roots that are used. They're small. And each one of these little nodules that you see is a new growth coming. You could actually divide these roots into one, two, three, four, five plants. If you have um, conditions that are what it likes natively, which it grows in the northeastern seaboard. So in the forest of the northeastern, all the way from Canada, southern Canada, down through the south, um, down through Georgia, etc. And so if you have an old growth forest with a rich soil, uh, with a cold winter, it will grow. And you don't have to plant it in the forest. You could actually plant it like in the shady part of your house or the shady part of your garden and you can grow your own golden seal. It takes three or four or five years to get a good crop going so that you harvest your own. But that's a really great thing to do because with these plants that are at risk and endangered, we have to help them. We have to help reestablish the wild gardens and bring them back. Herbalists have been very active in, in helping to replant the wilds. So I'm very proud of our, of, of, of our um, herbal community for doing that. So it, again, it's not necessarily not using golden seal. 
but but purchasing it from organic uh, growers who are growing it organically. What you'll oftentimes see ethically wildcrafted, but you have to really decide, you know, I don't think it's possible to ethically wild craft something that is endangered and at risk, unless it's growing in your own backyard and you're monitoring, you know, really watching your population yourself and judging whether you're harvesting it is actually encouraging it to grow more because sometimes that can happen. But I wouldn't take a company's word for it. They all are gonna tell you that they harvest it ethically. I've never met a wild crafter or a company who says, I did an unethical harvest. <laughs> I think they think they are, but you know, it's impossible to ethically harvest wild, craft, wild golden seal unless it's coming from your own patch. It's a beautiful, incredible, amazing plant, a small, shy woodland plant um, that was very much used by the native people. It was so common in the early days, they used it for dyeing their clothing because it does make a beautiful kind of green dye. So let's see who else. Oh, I have so many more plants, but um, I think that is. And then is it nearing eight? I'm wondering if, if we're getting, I don't want to keep our people much longer. We're, we're getting close to uh, seven, we're at 725. Oh yeah, great. So maybe let's just see what the next plant is. I don't think I'm going to talk about it, but I love looking at them. Oh, Yarrow, yeah. Okay, I, have, let's, I want to show something. Let's keep going a little bit. Let's just go through the slides. I'll tell you when to stop, if you would. Chanel? Yeah, yarrow, spilanthes, beautiful plant, much like echinacea. Let's keep going. I'm gonna, I want there's, and this is usnea. I just put this one in because it's such a fun plant. It's also really good for the bronchioles and the immune system. It's a lichen, halfway between an algae and a fungus. Okay, let's see. We'll keep going. This is such a fun one. This is lemon balm. I put lemon balm in because we were talking earlier about how sometimes during those long winters, people get a little bit, their spirits get down and lemon balm lifts the spirit. And plus it's just a wonderful herb to grow and drink. It's beautiful for your gardens. All of you permaculturists, you wanna plant an endless amount of lemon balm because it supports the bee populations. Its botanical name means bee and beekeepers have been growing and loving this plant for thousands of years because it's supports healthy beehives. Yeah, and also healthy people. We'll keep going. There's a particular pie I wanted, oh, and borage. Borage is another one. Look at, you can't help but be, look, feel happy when you look at that beautiful little star plant. Yeah, it's, you just wanna grow a ton of borage. It doesn't dry well. Borage has to be used fresh. We're not the only ones who love these herbs. This is the one I wanted to show you. So this is a picture taken of a beautiful garden uh, in Northern Vermont. And these are the orbs of light that I was talking about. Oftentimes the spirits show up as orbs of light. And this is, these are particularly strong, you know, in person you could see them, but they weren't as, it's the light going off on them that's making them. We would see them floating around the garden, but they were more uh, luminous than what we're seeing here. So, um, and then this is plurzy root. This is a really important plant um, for the bronchioles, for deep-seated bronchial infection. If, if the coltsfoot and the mullein and the comfrey and the garlic and the horseradish aren't working and there's a really deep-seated infection and you have that deep green mucus, you know, that slimy, ucky mucus that we don't like, um, plurzy root is the herb of choice to use. But once again, the plurzy, which is native to the North American prairies, is at risk and endangered. And we don't recommend that you use wildcrafted. It makes a stunning, it belongs to the milkweed family, by the way, so it's very, very easy to grow. And it makes a stunning garden plant. And not only do humans love it, but the bees, it's a favorite plant of the bees and the butterflies. So you plant, you plant plurzy root, Asclepius tuberosa is this particular uh, milkweed, you plant like a large patch of it and you'll have hundreds of monarchs coming to your garden. You'll have all kinds of butterflies and you'll have all these uh, honeybees and native pollinators. And then in the fall of the year, you just dig one or two of the roots, you, you know, and leave most of your patch. It's a perennial, so it'll come back year after year. And it's one way of, you know, just breeding, introducing and breeding the wild back to your garden and then inviting the wild creatures to come to your yard. 
because you're loving the wildness, right? Yeah, it's really beautiful. Look at that, it's heavenly. And this, of course, also, we'll leave it on that. All right, I think we're good. I have a lot more, but I think that that's good for, uh, that's a good enough for the evening, right? Oh, that was amazing. That was, that was <laughs> quite a list. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Rosemary. Yeah. That was wonderful. It was beautiful. Are there any questions? It's always good to have questions. It always makes you feel that you haven't done a good job teaching if you don't get questions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I had some questions and I forgot them. <laughs> oh, <wait. laughs> I was trying to those? bite my tongue to not ask any questions. <laughs> I know. You need my brain tonic. I do too. <laughs> I oh yeah, I was thinking that. I know. I know. I didn't realize that rosemary was so I mean, I've I've always loved rosemary and just using it. It's one of my favorite herbs for culinary use, but I didn't realize it had so many um other properties and to stimulate your mind. I yeah, it's yeah. Remember Shakespeare, I, Rosemary, for remembrance. You find you actually find many old texts referring to Rosemary for memory, but then also modern research, like scientific studies and the chemical constituents show that it activates your brain, um, you know, your brain. And then it's an incredible medicinal. So interesting to study the medicinal properties of your culinaries because you see that they were some of the most important medicines for people like um, in places like India and, and Mexico where they eat a lot of hot spicy foods. It's because those hot spicy foods help preserve the food. And also they were almost all of them antiseptics, antibacterial agents because um, you have so much bacteria growing in those hot, moist climates, right? Or hot climates. And so those foods actually purified inside and then also kept food from spoiling. So yeah, so, and you see that over and over and over again, like uh, with, with different foods and how they were introduced into the kitchen. You always see uh, basil with tomatoes, right? Because we couldn't even hardly imagine eating tomatoes without basil in the summertime, right? <laughs> But it's because basil actually aids in the digestion of acids. So somewhere a long time ago, without scientific studies or laboratory rat, rats, heaven forbid, um, people just knew, they discovered in, that basil would aid the digestion, would make digesting acidy foods better. Oh, yeah. Wow. I know. It's cool. Yeah. It's awful. <laughs> okay. And, okay, borage. I know we, like, passed that briefly. Oh, um love that what is, yeah i've i've grown it just for the bees and just to eat the flowers yeah. um because they taste like cucumbers and just oh, yeah. them on my yeah. salads but i'm not extremely familiar with yeah so a borage the old saying for borage was i borage give courage and so when you look back in the ancient textbooks ones that were written like 500 years ago um they, borage was always an herb that was used to help people with melancholy and depression and, you know, to lift the spirits. But actually modern research, again, confirms that because it's also used for the heart muscle um, in the same, same way, not as strong, but in similar ways, I would say, as hawthorn. Um, and the, it doesn't dry well. That's the one thing. So you either can make a flower essence with the flower, but the leaves are also really tasty. They're a little hairy but they have a, that same cucumber flavor. So they're nice if you chop them up really fine mm. and you put them in a salad or you can put them in the blender with yogurt, you know, and then a little bit of seasoning spice, maybe a little salt and pepper and you get that nice cucumber flavor. So you can make a nice dip with them. But a lot of those plants that we, that I was mentioning like the hawthorn, I, well, I didn't talk about hawthorn but like St. John's wort and the uh, lemon balm and the borage, those plants are really, they just, subtly you know they just help your spirits lift and they're really helpful for people that get mild depression i wouldn't say serious depression but mild depression and like seasonal light disorders you know that seasonal mm. light suspective disorder it's good for stuff like that yeah awesome yeah i love the board oh, and i have that one picture i don't think it was in the slide no it wasn't i have one picture of this little delicate borage cracking cement actually coming up through cement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, plants. So again, you know, watching the tenacity of plants and how they 
not only survive, but thrive. And then not only, not only thrive, but thrive beautifully. Mm-hmm. You know, it's really remarkable. And it's such a teaching for us. You know, we get, we're very, as I said, unrooted. And there is a lot that's going on. But when you look at what our ancestors survived, I mean, what we're going on is just human history and it's repeating itself. And we need, that's what we need to put an end to. We need to find a way to reach out and take a giant step forward in consciousness, right? And really end wars so that we can get ahead with our involvement in our consciousness. But humans have gone through these things before. And I really think that we learn a lot by looking at how other life forms, again, survive, thrive, create beauty, create medicine for others. You know, it's a great teaching to us. Yeah. Yeah. I'm preaching. I hate preaching. (laughs) And I, when you showed the picture of Colt's foot, that grows all over because where I'm living in the Ozarks, there's like rivers and, and lakes yeah. all, and creeks all over the place. And I've been, I've, I, that plant has jumped out to me because there's like thick drifts of it everywhere. Yeah, and, so true. And you will, I should mention this. I, I really should have mentioned that you will read that um, it's a family to watch out for. It belongs to the same family as Comfrey. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's some potential for small amounts, tiny amounts of the paralyzing alkaloids that they're so worried about in that family. But with that said, first of all, you're never eating or drinking copious amounts of cold foot. You're using it as a medicine. It's not a food. So you're using it maybe three or four or five or six cups every few days, if that. And it has minute amounts of any in it. So it's really, the warning is there you know, because everybody has to be super safe, but there's never ever been a case of anybody having any toxicity to using it ever. So you, you, it, you know, if you wanted to get, it's like with the elderberry, if you wanted to get yourself sick using it, you probably could, but you would have just to thinking that concentrated amounts and huge amounts over a long period of time. And nobody's going to do that with cold split because it's a, it's a medicine that you take specifically for coughs and colds and respiratory imbalances. Mm. And even if a person was to blend it with other herbs, say peppermint and spearmint and mullein, and use it over a long period of time, it's not gonna create harm because it's in a formula, mm. um, you know, in a smaller portion. So, so often the studies are done on single isolates. So single plant constituents taken out of the whole plant and tested on laboratory rats. And it really does not give us really potent. Yeah, because that's not how we would use it anyway. No, nobody takes the chemical unless you're using a drug. And that's the problem with drugs. I mean, they work incredibly, they're very powerful, but they have a vast amount of side effects because they're so concentrated. Where plants are compounds of thousands of different chemicals. So sometimes, like I was mentioning that, like in a mullein leaf, you have the tannins that are drying and astringent, but they're also combined with the mucilage that is soothing. So, you know, it'd be like every one of us here who is talking, except for Grady, perhaps, we have a bad chemical in us. We have something bad, right, that we don't love about ourselves. And if you just took that out, that one bad thing about us, we'd look like a terrible person. But when it's put into the whole of who we are and how we function in the world, it's part of what makes us really the incredibly beautiful people we are. Like my little faults actually, when it's all combined with my talents, actually make me be able to accomplish and do what I do. So it's the same with plants. You know, they're going to have thousands of chemicals in them. And some, if they were concentrated and really strong, might make the plant a little toxic. But in the whole, especially when it's combined in the ways that they are, they're actually part of the medicine. And when they are really concentrated in the toxic effects, then we actually have a lot of warnings about them. Those are our really strong herbs that we don't have available to us because we learned a long time ago in history that those herbs could have dangerous side effects if we didn't Mm -hmm. use them carefully. Most of those are used by the pharmaceutical industry, interestingly enough. (laughs) I'm sorry, I hope I didn't make that too complicated, but I'm just trying to- No, no, lots of things to think about. Yeah, Yeah, thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. Well, thank you. It's good. Is does anybody else have any other questions? And 
If not, I want to. Do you have a question? I want to come to your class, Grady. What are you going to start teaching? Mm. I don't know. Pretty soon. Pretty you should start making some herbal products. Maybe you could make some elderberry syrup next summer. Yeah. Yes, I definitely am. I actually may actually. I still have I still have elderberries on my tree. <laughs> really? Well, the really high ones. I got them. Yeah, those them. are for the yeah. birds. Those we can leave them. those for the birds. We have some frozen ones. Yeah. Oh, there you go. That's beautiful. Grady has done some very good presentations in our class. That's cool. Yeah. That's so nice. <laughs> well, thank you all for joining. I hope that I was able to share some information that was new or different or just, you know, made you think a little oh, bit. It, yeah. Definitely. Definitely, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, it's, it's always just so soothing um, and uh, it's hard to describe, but when you talk, it's it's such a a, a peacefulness, um, and I feel like I learn so much more just listening to you than than to read about a plant oh, because you. you know them. You you have such an intimate relationship with <laughs> each one of them, and you share their uh, their beautiful qualities. Um, oh. Yeah, it's thank I'm not you. Wording that very well, but. Well, I wish we could all be together and go out for a romp. Well, not right now because we're covered in snow, but in the springtime when everything comes out. So, <laughs> but this is, you know, I actually am so appreciative of Zoom because it brings us all together. You know, yes. I'm one of those people. I just am thankful because so many people are able to share this way. Without it, I think it would be, you know, it'd be so hard. And this, this yes. is fun. I'm, yeah. I'm and fine. I just, for everybody who is listening, if, for the younger youth, I just, really, I'm so grateful for your vision. And, you know, my hope is in you, really, you know, I can see that how incredibly brave and smart and willing you all are. So thank you for being and studying permaculture, because it really truly is an incredible model for how to live on this planet. And I'm really so happy to see how it's spreading, you know, the message is getting out there far and wide. Yeah, yeah. it is. And we, yeah. we have so much fun uh, connect making all these connections um, and especially with the youth it's, it's pretty wonderful and, and I don't know if you if you caught that I, I think I sent it to you about our our challenge that we're running right now no you soil your undies <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I'm not sure about that one <laughs> hey, Annette yeah it's a little bit hard to hear you Oh, okay. Let me sit closer. Um, so the soil your undies is you bury a pair of cotton underwear in the <laughs> soil, and about eight weeks later you take it out, and hopefully it's all shredded, and that means your soil is in great shape. And oh. if it's not, then that's okay too. You just add you just need to add some compost to your soil. So we're gonna we're gonna be celebrating that next month at our <laughs> gathering. <laughs> this is a time when you want to have dirty undies, right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> I love that. That is awesome. You know, some of my favorite remedies, I have this incredible formula that I make, uh, that I learned from a guru, actually, Haridas Baba, Baba, about 40 years ago. And you, you actually make it and then you bury it in the garden and you leave it down there for 17 days. And then you, it's in a jar, you know, and you wrap it all up in burlap and stuff and you put it in the garden and then you bring it out. And then after 17 days in, in the earth, it's ready to use. I, I, oh. like, for some reason, the dirty underwear reminded me of that, of the hard <laughs> dust baba garlic juice. <laughs> well, that sounds good. So I'll check back in. You can let me know how dirty the pants did. <laughs> There we go. There we go. <laughs> all right, sweetie. So good to talk to you all. Thank you for uh, inviting me. And thank you, Rosemary. Thank yeah. you so much for yeah. being here. It's really an honor to have you it, and it to just it's been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And Annette, sometime between now and early next week, I'll send you that handout, okay? Okay. And I'll send right, everybody that registered. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> thank you. Bye bye.
Bye, Rosemary. Happy holidays to everybody. Happy holidays. <laughs> Happy holidays. Thank you, Grady. You have a wonderful holiday, sweetie. Thank you. <laughs> oh, wow. That was amazing. That was amazing. Yay. Well, we, Thank you, um, Rosemary. Uh, we want to close it out, but we also want to let you know about a regenerative farming course that we're offering. It's, it's offered to the youth, but we invite families, and that is through the Great Awakening Academy, um, and we will add that link in with uh, our follow-up email uh, to everybody that's registered along with the, the link of the recording of tonight in case you missed part of it. Um, or you know somebody that wants to listen to it. And then after that, it'll be available on YouTube. Um, and then next month, uh, uh, we'll, every month we have a Permeus America's gathering and we celebrate one of the prim permaculture principles. And next month is our one year anniversary and we will be celebrating Observe and Interact. So stay tuned and we will let you know the date of that and uh, what we will be doing and talking about. And uh, we'll have a whole lot of fun with that. And um, Chanel, did I leave anything out or can you think of anything we need to share with them? Um, the, the regenerative farming permaculture classes. Oh, did I mentioned mention that. that. Oh. Um, and I'll put the, we'll put the I link think, in. I think you covered it. I think we did. <laughs> okay. Well, um, thank everybody for being here tonight. We really appreciate all of you. Um, and we hope that you'll join us again. If you have any questions for us, let us know. Oh, and yeah, Grady. I thought yeah. Grady was going to. Yeah, Grady, would you, would you mind closing us out and maybe just saying something for everybody? I'm just, I'm going to say that I I I want to thank that have gave gave time to 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 um noticed um notice the earth and take care of it and I'm gonna thank everybody for being there for us at 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 all at any any time and i think the teachers that taught us this class <laughs> and i want to to wish all of you luck on your um thank you <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you Grady. Grady. <laughs> awesome. We love Until that. next time. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night. Goodbye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Rosemary. <laughs> Thank Bye, you. Alana or Elena. Bye, Millie. Bye. Thank Anna. you. Thanks for being with us. Bye. Bye, Grady.